You, my listener, know names such as Ruger, Marlin, Smith Wesson. You know names of engines. You know brands of computers, uh, cars, and of course, you probably know names of team players and coaches. Of which I I wouldn't be able to uh, have any kind of conversation with you on those masculine topics. Now, your your wife, on the other hand, she knows a whole uh, alternative universe of names and brands. Now, you you may not uh, know much about uh, about uh, cookware. You may not know about Lodge, a famous name uh, here in the South, one of the largest names of uh, of cast iron cookware in, in the world. And yet here it is. Uh, it is. You might know it in a business context, but she knows it in the cooking context. And of course, that's the one that really matters. Uh, what your your sweetheart does when you're uh, you're on your way home, and and uh, she's uh, she's gotten a, a home ahead of you from her job, and the children are there, and uh, dinner uh, is is being is, is being cooked on a in a lodge uh, skillet. Now, lodge is in Marion County in South Pittsburgh, and there are big uh, big doings there. This is a, a an area a regional business that has made a name for itself, lodge manufacturing, and we have uh, we have on the phone. Mark Kelly, who is the public relations manager. Uh, Mark, what is the news out of Lodge Manufacturing? Uh, we started operations with our new foundry in South Pittsburgh. We've had a foundry operating for uh, decades. Uh, actually, the, that foundry fired up in 1910, and we've expanded it through the years. But in June of 2016, we began operation, began construction on a new 212 or 127,000 square foot uh, foundry, which has two production lines, um, which starts from the melting of the metal to the pouring of the metal into sand cast molds. And um, essentially, this new foundry will increase our production capacity 75%. With the older foundry, we had an expansion that was completed in January of 2015, which increased our production capacity 50%. So in a matter of three years, we have increased our production capacity by 125%, uh, which is, in, in any, <laughs> any business is amazing, but particularly in the foundry business, it's, it's quite extraordinary. We, um, we've seen tremendous growth. Since 2002, when we launched uh, Foundry Season Cast Iron Cookware, which takes the uh, phobias or the questions out of the minds of the consumer on how do I do this? Um, if you have a piece from your family, whether it's your grandmother's or great-grandmother's, they had taken the time to properly make it uh, easy release or natural non-stick. But the, the Foundry Seasoning really kicked it off for us. Business started to to grow, and in 2010, it really just took off the charts, so we've been adding capacity. Um, currently, we have 3,000 domestic dealers in the U.S., and we're sold in 60 countries around the world. Our biggest dealers in the States are Walmart, um, Amazon, Target, stores of that nature, but the, the whole key, even more so than the, the seasoning, is the meticulous nature of our manufacturing. We monitor our metal chemistry every 30 minutes. We melt our metal at 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 800 degrees hotter than molten lava. Um, and the it, primary ingredients for making that metal chemistry is pig iron and uh, recycled stamped steel. There's several other things we put in there, but I, I can't tell you that. And then, and we pour into a big ladle, and then it's taken over to the automatic pouring area. And uh, we we pour into the sand cast molds at 2,500 degrees okay, Fahrenheit. Hold it right there. If it's too hot, it burns through the sand cast molds. If it's too cold, it sticks. So, well, by Goldilocks, back up it has, just has to be just right. Excuse okay, me. we're talking with Mark Kelly, and uh, the the question that comes to mind, and I want to ask it before I forget: uh, What is a sand cast mold? I, I don't really understand how this works. We we all, my listener, and I have the picture of the the, the metal liquid rolling down a little. Uh, uh, a little train there, uh, and then what is the sand cast mold about? How how is the pan made? Is that is it not just a, it, a bucket that make? How does it work? Uh, explain the well. The sand essentially, part. there are two blocks of uh, sand. Uh, we call it we call that green sand. It's um, sand, uh, water, and clay. Um, after several uses, the, the sand turns black. But uh, we create a cavity in the uh, block. And metal, molten metal is shot in there, and the the, the uh, steel tooling 
creates the shape of each piece of cookware. So essentially they're individually made and the metal pours in there and it forms in that cavity based on the shape from the impression tooling. We make over 130 different cast iron items. So we have tooling for each of those items. And um, it, it was the, with the Sixth Street Foundry, the old foundry, we were able to make between six, uh, excuse me, 1,800 and 8,000 pieces an hour. And the, the difference is because of the size of the pieces. We have some relatively small serving pieces. So it's much like the, the old Plato um, thing we used to play with as kids where you had the little impression that we go into the clay at Plato. And, and it's much like that, but it's, this is much more scientific. But that's how it's done. And, and essentially, that's how it's been done since the Chinese invented um, cast iron items in the Middle Ages for military weapons. All we've done is automate it and really become focus, uh, hyper focus on the metal chemistry. But that's that's it in a nutshell. And uh, the amazing thing is, once we pour in that sand cast mold, from that time to packing is all of ninety minutes. So it's poured. It goes through several stages of cleaning, uh, then then se the seasoning process, and then it's packed and um, and ready to go. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you next, uh, Mark Kelly. What is the seasoning process? What is that about? Why is that important? And explain why, when you started doing that, your sales took off in 2010. But essentially, it's seasoning is uh, putting fat on the any type of fat or or or. Any, something of that nature. Back in the day, people would put lard and other things on it. We rec recommend vegetable Crisco, but it when we bake on that oil at at a hot, very high temperature, and it turns those oil, that oil into carbon particles, which create a natural, easy release or non-stick aspect for the cookware. If you did not have that, the the food would stick to the cookware. Um, and you'd have to scrape when we it started. Off. To, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then you'd have to scrape it off, uh, but with a uh, with a metal, some kind of metal thing, but with with the sort of not non-stick or stick resistant uh, coating uh, seasoning. You you just wash your pan with uh, just a wet hot wet brush. Is that it? Uh, you know, a lot of people do that do it that way. Um, there's many ways to clean it, as there are people. Some people like to use a a mild uh, dish detergent. That's perfectly fine. I personally just do the the rinse and and, and wipe, and that's okay. Um, but the the key to the success of this is even after the seasoning, is to cook with it and cook and cook and cook. And the more you cook, oils from that food, and there's oil in everything from uh, protein to vegetables. Um, the more that happens, the better the the non-stick quality becomes uh, one thing we recommend for newer pieces is before you cook with it right wipe a light amount of vegetable oil or olive oil all over the cookware and then after you clean it do the same thing and put it on the stove top or in the oven at uh, low to medium low for a few minutes to let those oils seep in and that truly enhances the seasoning of the cookware um, to me, it's 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 I equate it to much like oiling a baseball glove or uh, putting wax on a surfboard or a skis. We're talking with it, Mark. without that without that seasoning process, it it doesn't perform as well and uh, food sticks. But uh, well seasoned pans are highly revered, and people uh, can't wait to get Granny's cookware when 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 she goes to greater glory because it's it's a well seasoned pan, and you can cook just about anything in those in the pans or Dutch ovens or the griddles or, or whatever you're, you're using. We're talking with Mark Kelly from Lodge Manufacturing. Now, Mark, the Lodge family, the, it's named at, the company's named after the, the Lodges, and there is a fifth-generation Lodge uh, working in the business. Who is, who is this person? And say something about Henry. The, uh, well, no, say Henry, about the, Henry Lodge is the CEO. He is uh, Joseph Lodge. Joseph Lodge is a company founder. He yes, started yeah. the company here in South Pittsburgh in 1896. Uh, Henry is a fourth generation descendant. Um, he had formerly been president, and he, he was named CEO last summer. Um, Bob Kellerman, who was who's still with us, he's retiring at the end of the year. He had been the uh, CEO and chairman for many years. And he's a fourth generation descendant. Kind of give you a family background. Uh, Joseph Lodge, the son married and had two children. 
the daughter married a, a man named Kellerman, and they had seven children. So that kind of breaks down the family uh, dynamics. The fifth generation um, person is Lee Riddle. He's our vice president of sales. His mother was a Kellerman, so that's the family connection there. But uh, it's it's an it's amazing family to be associated with. And I, I know it's. Uh, a cliche for people to say it's a real family atmosphere, but that's that's the way it is here. There's a online magazine called The Bitter Southerner, and they did a story on us a couple of years ago called The Lucky Dogs of South Pittsburgh, and they really the writer really nailed our company culture to a T. But uh, we, you know, it's it's an amazing place to work. We have a great benefits package. Our four hundred one k is doing well. But the, the more more important than that is um, the way management interacts with employees and employees with each other. It's it's um, I've never worked in a place like this before, and it's it's very rewarding. And there are four hundred of you uh, at Lodge Manufacturing. Yes, when I started here in, in uh, January of two thousand and five, we had one hundred eighty five employees, and now we have a little over four hundred. So it's and, and that includes our four factory stores. But uh, yeah, we've. We've experienced tremendous growth, and the thing that's just really been um, interesting is is we don't do any consumer advertising. We do a lot of product placement with uh, TV shows, uh, newspapers, and magazines, which and that's been very effective for us. And then we have a we have an amazing social media team that really uh, gets our message out there. That's great, but more importantly, our customers are our best salespeople. They love our products. They love our company culture, and uh, that makes everything go. We're talking with Mark Kelly of Lodge Manufacturing. Last question, how, what kind of investment, how, how much was spent to bring this uh, new foundry uh, up from scratch and now running in South Pittsburgh? Well, we, you know, we also uh, built a new uh, distribution center in the last year, so that, uh, and that's a 212,000 distribution center on the other side of the Tennessee River from us in the little town of New Hope. So between the distribution center and the uh, foundry, it's an investment of $90 million. $90 million. And uh, does, it, was yep. that, did you finance that, or did, does that come from uh, family capital and internal capital? Oh, yeah, we, we, fin- we financed it, yes. Well, Mark Kelly, thanks for joining my, my list of me here on, uh, on the David Tula Show. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Mark Kelly is uh, the public relations manager at Lodge Manufacturing in South Pittsburgh, and the story is of a major investment. Uh, now, I've got something. Uh, we're going to change topics. I want you to hear this the following, uh, this following uh, clip of a man being executed by a police officer. Who else is in the room? Nobody. Nobody else is in the room? Nobody. The Nobody. shaver Nobody. execution. Okay. But apparently we Mesa, have Arizona. a failure for you to comprehend simple instructions. I'm going to go over some of them again. Okay. Can you both hear an understanding? Yes. All right. If you make a mistake, another mistake, there is a very severe possibility you're both going to get shot. Do you understand that? Yes. I do. Yes. All right. What the? This is... Shut up. I'm not here to be tactful or diplomatic with you. You listen, you obey. Open carry state. For one thing, did I tell you to move, young man? Did I tell you to put both your hands put both your hands on the top of your head and interlace your fingers? Take your feet and cross your left foot over your right foot. Who else is in the room? Nobody. Unarmed man. Six automatic rifles aimed at him. Cops. Very nervous. Right, stand by, we have Courageous cops. All right. He's slightly drunk. Are you both drunk? No. No. All right. So you're not going to have any problems understanding anything that I tell you, right? Correct. Yes. All right. Can I go to my room? No, you're not going to do anything but come towards us. Young man, you are not to move. You're to put your eyes down and look down at the carpet. You're to keep your fingers interlaced behind your head. You're to keep your feet crossed. If you move, we're going to consider that a threat, and we are going to deal with it, and you may not survive it. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Young lady, shut up and listen. 
right? You are to keep your feet crossed. Take both of your hands, put them flat in front Six of you. Six weapons aimed at these unarmed you people on the floor. You are to kneeling position. Listen. Kneeling position. They're moving now. Now, put both your hands in the air. Okay, crawl towards us. I'm so sorry. Okay. Stop. Okay. Let's come grab pull. No, Rich, pull. Pull. This way. Let me know when you're clear. Clear? No, you're not clear. You have a question. Yes. They're being arrested yeah. as if they were terrorists with bomb, bomb triggers on the persons. A woman and a man. Daniel Shaver is the victim. Okay, I need one more cup for up. Okay. Six cops all aiming their guns. This is the deal. We're going to do almost like we did before. Okay. Okay, young man, listen to my instructions and do not make a mistake. You are to keep your legs crossed. Do you understand me? You are to put both of your hands, palms down, Lethal straight threat. out in front of you. This is called state Push terrorism. Up to a kneeling position. I said, keep your legs crossed. Sorry. They're about to kill him. Watch. I didn't say this in conversation. Keep Put your hands in the air. Hands up in the air. You do that again, we're shooting you. Do you understand? Do not shoot me. I'm then listen to my instructions. I'm trying to do what you Don't talk. Do. Listen. Hands straight up in the air. Armed cops. Do not put your hands down for they any reason. They should not reason. have guns. You think you're going to fall, you better fall in your face. Your hands go back in the small of your back or down. We are going to shoot you. Do you understand me? Crawl towards me. Crawl towards me. Don't go. Get up on him. Okay, no, they... hold on him. One with me. These, this victim may rise up and kill them, so they're, they're having covered. They're not tending to his wounds. They're going to check the door now. They're going to check the wrong door. Key card, key card. Key card. Key card. They're trying to unlock the door. Maybe some suspects inside. They've just gunned a man down, an innocent civilian, no gun, no weapon. He was trying to pull his pants up. What's that, man? This is David Tullis, and we've been hearing the execution of an innocent man, Daniel Shaver, by Mesa County uh, officers. And the, the man who pulled the trigger, uh, full of uh, courageous, courageous tattoos on his arms, and, uh, and with uh, the, uh, the insignia on his service weapon, I can't use the word on the, on the radio, but it says, your F, okay, your F-bomb. Uh, on the weapon. In other words, the weapon which is intended for death and destruction uh, is used uh, for that very purpose by one of the six officers, all aiming uh, military carbines at a man who uh, was a uh, a man who worked in the in the uh, the pest control business. And he had he had in his hotel room a, a pellet gun that he used sometimes to shoot uh, bir loose birds and such in uh, in stores that were uh, needing pest control. And someone uh, down five floors below. In the uh, in the yard or near the pool of the hotel in Mesa, Arizona, said, "Oh, there's a man with a gun in the window." And so it's a constitutional carry state. You can carry a weapon at any time, anywhere, openly. And uh, someone was stupid enough. The clerk was asinine enough to call the cops. He called 911. This is David Tulis. Call your live on the air. What's on your mind? David, I watched the entire video. The guy that was screaming wasn't evidently the guy with the gun. No, it's separate. That was his, I believe, sergeant. Sergeant Langley. And, you know, I think they were doing this as a training video, too. That's the way it looked like. And if that dick, if I saw him on the street, I'd have no choice but to raise my gun on him because I'd fear for my life. And first of all, telling his wife to shut up, if he made it through this, he should have met him on the street and beat the crap out of him. Anybody with that many tattoos, I think, has an issue. And how he was even hired is beyond me. But evidently, there is a war going on. And I recommend all Americans be, be armed uh, to fight against this. Remember, the police have no more rights than you. You have more rights than the police under the Second Amendment. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't agree with you at first, but I do agree with you now that 
based on everything I've seen over the past couple of years, all police would be disarmed. Period. The, the arms, the arms should be possessed and carried by the citizenry, and the police should be there to serve process uh, and to help investigate actual crime. That, that's what policing should be about. Uh, law enforcement, we've had enough of law enforcement, and the Shaver execution, which we have, we have those here. The Daniel Stevenson execution in East Ridge in August of 2016 is the same thing, the same thing, same weapon, point blank execution, five rounds. Because it takes about that much time for the man to hit the ground. And the last round that hit uh, the plumber in East Ridge uh, was when uh, he was down and hit him in the back. David Tools. Traffic, news, and information. Nugo Radio, Digital FM 95.3 HD4 and 92.7 FM.